Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, panel discussion, uh, which I'm very uh, happy to moderate. My name is Iftekhar Dadi. I teach at Cornell University, and I'm a member of the editorial board of uh, Art Margins. I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome the, uh, the editors of Art Margins uh, for a discussion today to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Art Margins Journal. Uh, so just um, in, in housekeeping, we will basically have a discussion for about six, 60 minutes, uh, followed by uh, uh, questions uh, from uh, addressing questions from the audience. If you have um, questions or comments for the panel, please post them in the Facebook chat, and we will uh, hopefully have time to address them uh, at the end of the session. Um, so uh, let me begin by introducing our uh, speakers. Um, uh, today we are joined by um, uh, the members of the editors, uh, the, ed the editors of Art Margins Journal, which includes Elizabeth Harney uh, from the University of Toronto, Octavian uh, Esanu from the American University of Beirut, and Jela uh, Harutonian from the American University of Beirut, Karen Benesra from uh, Lupana University in Lüneburg, uh, Pedro Erber from Basida University, Tokyo and Sven Spiker from University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, so um, let me begin by, uh, uh, by posing a few questions to our, uh, uh, the editors. Um, so, um, so one thing to address would be to, for the audience to, to, to speak briefly about uh, uh, art, art Margins uh, journal, uh, its history, its relationship, to art margins or online. And uh, especially these would be, I think, relevant for the founding editors to discuss, which, which are Sven, Angela, and Octavian. So uh, if um, Sven, Angela, or Octavian, if you would like to address this. Thank you so much, Iftika. Um, I think I'll, I'll start. Um, first of all, thank you for, for moderating. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here. It's a very special day a special day in many ways. Uh, it's been 10 years that uh, Angela Octavian and I uh, got together to found this journal, this print journal, um, on the basis or alongside an already existing uh, online publication, Art Margins Online, that continues to exist as a separate um, publication. So um, certainly an occasion to celebrate, but also, of course, a very somber occasion. Um, we're witnessing um, the, the appalling, horrible onslaught by the Russian military on Ukraine, uh, something that uh, has left us deeply, deeply uh, scarred and depressed. And um, that, of course, makes uh, our discussion pale in comparison and in importance compared to events like these. Yet we, we press ahead, we, we, we decided not to cancel the discussion, uh, but I want to acknowledge um, that we're with those people in Ukraine uh, who are going through so much um, at the moment. And we salute our friends and uh, our readers uh, in that part of the world. Um, we're with you. Um, indeed, Art Margins has, uh, from the very beginning, be, had, had very close ties to, to Eastern Europe. Um, Art Margins Online, uh, its predecessor publication was, was founded um, as a, a publication that that hoped to 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 um, institute dialogue, to create dialogue between the art scenes of Eastern Europe, which in the 1990s uh, were quite fragmented, and um, uh, the idea was really to establish a kind of horizontal dialogue uh, between artists and art critics and um, and institutions. Uh, at a time when it seemed as if the global art market was taking over Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern European art was, was enjoying a lot of commercial success. And really the effort was to, to, try and, uh, to try and offer constructive critique of what was going on at the moment, uh, at that time rather. Um, and uh, like I said, Art Margins Online continues, it thrives as a, uh, a separate uh, yet united uh, publication. We see ourselves as one publication with two different outlets in two separate media, but working very closely together. And while Art Margins uh, Online continues to have an Eastern European focus, um, uh, Art Margins Print, the sister publication that joined the online, uh, the, the online outlet, 
uh, 10 years later, um, injects that uh, Eastern European context into a kind of a global framework. So this is from the beginning, the task that we set for ourselves is to see 10 years on from the 1990s, what would happen if you looked at Eastern Europe in a more global framework, in a more global context. And we've continued to, um, to look at that global context. I'm sure that um, we'll have more discussion about this uh, from a critical angle, um, not, in a, not in a celebratory mood. Um, I think we're all now witnessing uh, to some degree, uh, you know, the problems with globalization. Uh, but uh, within a more narrow art historical frame, we're asking ourselves uh, what might the appropriate methodologies be um, to deal with a phenomenon like, uh, like global art, but uh, from a uh, robust um, local perspective uh, or local perspectives, um, I should say. So um, Art Margin Sprint uh, was founded 10 years ago and on that basis um, and continues to, yeah, continues to work collectively with now a, a broadly expanded uh, group um, of editors who, who work together. And uh, I can only say from, from my end that it's, it's, yeah, it's great fun. It's uh, something that has really enriched my life. And uh, maybe I'll hand it over to my colleagues to say a little bit more about their perspective. To, my, to Angela and to Octavia and in particular, who've been there from the beginning. Um, thank you, if I may continue. Uh, yes, I joined the editorial team when uh, um, Art Margins went to print with MIT Press, perhaps pre precisely that moment when um, there was a need to expand from uh, specifically Eastern <clears throat> European discourses to involve uh, global uh, art discourses. Um, and uh, since then, I think Art Margins has been problematizing um, simple periodizations that take uh, 1989 as a, as, a, as a ultimate rupture that launches uh, the world into the moment of global contemporary art and offering more complex periodizations of the way in which uh, contemporary art emer emerges um, in different contexts uh, across various national and geographic um, spreads and geographic uh, uh, situations, um, and perhaps also to map uh, the way in which this national regional discourses context of the emergence of contemporary art are visible or are made visible from the standpoint of more abstract uh, global contemporary that my colleague Octavia Neshanu uh, uses often the met metaphor of Star Alliance magazines of this abstract uh, globality that, we, that is being projected. Um, upon uh, various discourses that take globalization as a pure abstraction without concrete uh, specificity. Um, and uh, I think also what is important about this transition from the specifically Eastern European discourses, which are still uh, uh, part and parcel of art margins online, as Sven already mentioned, towards uh, including what we call the global margins um, in terms of uh, art historiography, um, is perhaps uh, also the desire to provide a critical mirror upon the very uh, conversations that evolve around global art history, and we can expand upon this uh, perhaps later in our conversation. Uh, thank you for, for inviting and for... Uh, um, I will add only to what Sven and Angela, I think, already said. I think each institution is implemented where it arises with a goal of answering to a problematic of its age. And as Sven already said, and Angela, the art, art margins, uh, it, uh, the art margins online, it emerged to kind of respond to this opening up of the of the world after the Cold War uh, uh, and to provide access to a lot of artistic production that was flourishing in the air and to just inform everyone of what were artists being involved in, in all that space. Um, in 2010, 2011, when Art Margins Print was instituted, I think, uh, there was already 20 years after the fall of the Cold War, after the end of the Cold War. And I think the journal wanted to draw some conclusions, maybe to see, to understand what happened in that uh, period. And I think it was the 
time of the of the Arab Spring, right? It was the year when new art, when new regions started to open up, and when we all realized that art is now being made, is being written about, is being produced in other places as well. It was also 2009, the time of the financial crisis, when we also realized that we were the, the, the that in some way we became the margins of these global financial institutions that were only pursuing their very uh, kind of narrow interests. So in all of this way, art, art margins kind of response to, to, to some epochs, to some, uh, to some periods, which are, uh, which are, uh, are somehow uh, 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 I indicated by these years of rupture, be it uh, 1989, be it 2011, the Arab Spring. And I think now by some tragic coincidence, or I don't know is this a coincidence or not, we kind of made a full circle when we come to year 2022, when we witness all of these crises starting with COVID and global pandemics and the economic crisis and, uh, and all of this uh, economic disparity and also of course the tragedy in Ukraine. So I think this is a new, it, it, it kind of marks or shows a new period, a new a new age in which, with which art margins and everyone who is involved with art margins will have to, to, to readjust, to respond, I guess, to that. Um, so uh, uh, the founding editors have been joined with, uh, you know, uh, in subsequent years by, uh, you know, others, which includes uh, Karen Ben Ezra, Elizabeth Harney, uh, Pedro Erber and Saloni Mathur, who's not uh, here with us today. Um, so I wanted to address this question to all the editors, uh, which is uh, how has art, mar art margins affected uh, your own thinking, your own work, your own uh, understanding of uh, contemporary art? Uh, so perhaps we can begin with uh, Pedro, would you like to take this uh, to begin with? Okay, so let me unmute here. Yes, um, you know, I think in a sense, because I, I joined uh, not uh, too long ago, um, and especially with COVID, one loses a little bit the sense of time, but um, it was shortly before the pandemic when I joined the first um, uh, in person a meeting with the editors, which was the, the beginning of me uh, starting to work with the journal. So it's, I think it's a little bit early to talk about, you know, uh, uh, reflections and of this in my work, which are going to, to come up. But I think what I, what I can say probably is, um, is more about uh, my collaboration with Art Margins before uh, joining as an editor, because that's basically how it started. And uh, it was back in 2000, uh, probably 13 or so when uh, Karen, who was, uh, had just joined uh, the, the collective, uh, told me about the journal and said, why don't you submit an article to Art Margins? Um, and she told me a little bit about uh, what it was. And I was reading um, the statement. And I remember even, you know, I, I, I took this, um, I, I went back to it re, uh, now thinking about the discussion. And I really wanna, I wanna quote from this because I remember seeing this uh, from the editorial um, statement in the first issue. Uh, when uh, in which it was said that uh, the journal wants to locate art margins, wants to locate transnational commonalities and trajectories that connect or divide different regions of the world, 
bringing together artistic practices from Polish transitional zones and so on and so forth. And I was reading that statement and thought, okay, well, that's exactly what uh, I'm trying to do. So it was this kind of like, uh, not coincidence, but it was really this uh, very uh, fortunate like encounter. And, and so um, I think um, this was, um, so I, I sent the article and that's how we started to, to collaborate. Um, and so I thought I really sort of like identified a lot with the, the way, uh, the, the purpose of the journal. And, um, and later on, uh, you know, was collaborating in, in different ways um, uh, with the journal and with uh, each of the editors. And, um, and more recently, you know, just as being part of the journal, I think one of the big um, themes uh, for all of us, and I think maybe one of the big differences uh, that, you know, others can talk about too, uh, between art margins and, you know, what I was used before in terms of journal editing is really the collective aspect of it. And really the fact that, you know, we read all uh, the articles and, and discuss uh, all of them. So sometimes it's difficult to explain uh, to, to other people what it means. Like you are uh, an editor, so oh yeah, part of the editorial board. No, it's not exactly, it's much more intensive than that. Uh, so we do actually everything uh, together, basically. And of course, it's, it's great also because of, you know, the people involved. But I think that kind of work um, is uh, probably um, one of the, the, the really special aspects of the, you know, learning uh, experience of, you know, other ways of editing and other ways of looking at text, like, you know, with, uh, you know, looking at uh, having these multiple perspectives on each of the texts that we analyze. So um, besides the thematic aspect, I think the, the methodological uh, side, I think is, is really something that will certainly uh, change also and reflect on the way we, we all work. So I, I want to just pass it on to. Uh, uh, how about Karen? Would you like to to address it from your vantage point? Sure. Um, thank you, and thanks everyone um, uh, for hosting. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's very closely intertwined with sort of the the journal is very closely intertwined with the way that I think about or think about the motivations for what I'm doing in part because I was just starting, I was, um, uh, I joined in 2012 or 2013 after um, Octavian approached me to contribute um, a couple of texts. And um, yeah, I think there were, I just pick up on a couple of points that I think Angela and Octavian sort of already mentioned. Um, one has to do with how the journal kind of, I think imminently sort of unfolds this relationship um, between conjunctures and sort of the totality of capitalism, right? How do we approach this relationship between singular contexts and sort of the dynamics of global capitalism? And it seems that this is a, a question that's ongoing and one that um, that for me is very special because it is the way that I see the sort of continuity or the relationship between the journal sort of as a, the print journal as a project and its kind of origins um, as rooted specifically in Eastern Europe. I think that was one of the things that first struck me that seemed really cool <laughs> about the project of the journal, even really before in the first volume, really before the first volume had come out. Um, and that has stayed with me, right? So I think that we're constantly experimenting with and kind of constantly, you know, seeing how we're trying to promote the ways that authors sort of tackle this um, question. Um, and another one has to do with, and this is maybe very, very close to the way that I think about my own work, um, is this sort of defining sort of what sort of kind of radically putting into question what theories and what objects can illuminate this relate the various relationships that we're looking at can illuminate the relationship between art and ideology that can illuminate the definition of art that can illuminate um, the sort of uh, cultural politics around different institutions and the de definition of the contemporary in, in different locales um, and that really that I think that the, in 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 its on in its on its best days the journal kind of um, uh, tries to really throw into question right um, really question sort of um, 
the idea that we can simply um, illustrate pre-given critical frameworks, frameworks inherited from other more historical journals, from the disc or even from the discourse of what has now become a very reified kind of um, uh, discourse about global art. So, um, you know, taking up, so, you know, I kind of appreciate it in the way that um, I think author, something I try to do and something that I, I try to, I don't know, that I think is interesting in a lot of the um, documents um, and in the research essays that we publish has to do with um, kind of really creating new frameworks, um, new critical frameworks for, um, for doing historiographical work, you know, from the theoretical contexts um, and from the sociocultural context um, that they're drawn from. Um, um, I would just add to the, the, the question that, that Pedro raised about the way of working that I know is very important to all of us, especially to Sven. Um, uh, I think that's something that we're straddling with and maybe perhaps we'll address um, in the conversation going forward um, is how we work as a collect. What I think, what is the import of the way that we work as a collective, right? So I think that there is something unique about that, um, but I think that the the consequence of that is all also has to do with the way that we, I think, are constantly um, struggling with and kind of pushing back against and trying to find ways around the kind of abstraction of the university discourse, the way that it tends to wrest judgment from editors, that tends to um, kind of technify the process of writing in a very kind of stultified way. And I think that this is something that we are constantly trying, we're constantly struggling with, you know, in order to produce something that is transmissible, that does conform to the codes of academic writing in the US, but at the same time that is constantly, I think not just butting, that sort of butts up against, let's say, difference from those codes, not simply in terms of syntax or conventions, but really where those codes meet, you know, different histories of writing, different ways of approaching problems that aren't neatly contained within the sort of MLA style or um, uh, uh, Chicago style of, of exposition. Uh, and I think that this is something that we're constantly struggling with and something that is part of the, one of the interests in, in trying to discover or trying to translate uh, works and something perhaps moving forward that, um, that we also, um, I don't know, that I think we're all interested in kind of approaching in different ways. But I think that part of the collective way of working um, and this very intensive way of editing that Pedro mentioned, I think has, for, in my mind, has to do with um, uh, it, the important way that the journal tries to really just, in, in a very positive way, doesn't fit in with the kind of technification, the kind of transactional sort of logic of a lot of academic publishing. Thank you. And we'll come back to the contents of the journal as well uh, in the next question. But I wanted to also request uh, Elizabeth Harney to give her reflections on as being part of the edit editors, uh, team of editors. Thank you, Thakari. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I, I really am a newbie here. I just joined during the pandemic about maybe six months ago, five months ago. So um, even more so than Pedro, I, I, it's probably a bit early for me to reflect um, on on my experience here, except to say that I suppose it came after somewhat of a longer courtship with Sven. Um, we were having long conversations about um, what it would mean to be part of this editorial collective. So I had uh, I had some time to reflect on that. And I think, I mean, I first came to the journal through a former editor, um, Anthony Gardner, who, um, who I had worked with on, uh, in various other kind of collective, situations thinking through ideas of global art history. So I, I knew of the journal for quite some time uh, and was sort of just trying to find the right moment to um, be able to join this wonderful group of people. Um, and I would just say just a couple of things. I, I think I was always attracted to it um, because I liked the idea that it was sort of premised on sort of reflecting on the aftermath or the afterlives of uh, it, you know, obviously, um, it, uh, um, history, histories of socialism in Eastern Europe, but in my case, it found so many parallels in all of the um, material I was working with in Africa and uh, all of the anti-colonial and non-aligned kind of um, historiographies I was interested in. And so it, I liked that kind of angle to it, but I also have also really liked the idea that the margins were never really um, understood uh, and I think continue to be sort of challenged within the model of you know, what we mean by art margins as anything necessarily to do with geography. Um, and then it was really margins were somehow kind of like a tool or a toolkit 
um, to really think about how we do uh, how we do history, how we think about history. And I also really liked um, this mix of, I think this goes back maybe to what um, Karen was saying too. I liked the mix of writing that was always part of this project. So uh, the fact that there is uh, always artist projects in there, um, the fact that there's a, a real dedication to documents and the archive, um, in addition to the kind of research essays that are that are um, that are brought into the fold, uh, and I think maybe the last thing was just this kind of sense that although we're all kind of dealing with this entity of of global art history in one form or another, that it really it seems to be about tracing networks, right? Networks and migrations of ideas and objects and peoples. Um, and uh, sure, we're linking different areas of the world and different moments in time together, but um, I think there's less of an emphasis on this kind of reification of, of the global um, within what we're trying to do. Uh, and then finally, I really wanted to be, I, I was really attracted after this long courtship to having colleagues um, who not only believed in really sharing um, uh, understandings of, uh, of how one produces knowledge, um, both through writing and through editing, but also wanted to see this collective in this journal as a kind of, a kind of um, um, uh, way in which to maybe mentor younger scholars um, and you know shift ideas in the field and so forth. So that it was really a kind of uh, a, a kind of activism underlying all of that model that I was really attracted to. So that leads actually nicely to the next, uh, uh, you know, which is uh, issues that already came up, having to do with uh, what does the journal look like, what does it have, what sections. Okay, I mean. Uh, uh, artist projects were mentioned and uh, other sections as well. Perhaps even Sven, if we can have a look at some of the covers and table of contents of some of the journals. And uh, if uh, if any of you, Angela, Octavian, Karen, would like to address the, you know, what the journal contains, basically. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I loved Elizabeth's reference to courtship. So one of the things I just wanted to to add uh, that that. Um, make the journal very attractive to me is that I've, I, I got to uh, court many people over these years and courting people is one of my favorite pastimes. So it's been uh, in that sense also a, a wonderful ride. Um, yeah, so um, I'm glad I get to say uh, maybe a couple of words about what the journal actually looks like. This of course is the, um, the, uh, the, the cover of the most recent um, issue that we put out, the anniversary issue that um, is just about uh, leaving the press to be distributed. Um, and I might skip uh, over to uh, this slide, which uh, shows you, I mean, many of you will have seen this, but maybe those of you who haven't, um, on the left, um, you know, one of the, one of the uh, more recent issues, and then a look at the uh, table of contents. So I think it was already mentioned that in, in many ways, the, the layout of the journal and the way in which its different sections interact um, reflect a thinking about academic publishing that is a little bit off the mainstream, that is a little bit uh, different from what you might expect in an academic journal. And from the very beginning, I remember lengthy discussions between Angela Octavian and I, um, what kinds of sections would we need in this journal and um, how could it best reflect what we were thinking such a journal should do. And um, one of the things that were clear from the very beginning was that we needed an artist section. And um, the artist section, that is to say, the way in which we hand over for every issue about, I believe it's 16 pages, to an artist whom we invite uh, to, to design a project specifically for the journal, this really became one of the core elements uh, of, um, of each individual issue and one that isn't merely ornamental. So this is very important. So it is a way um, of shifting the weight from the arguments that we're making uh, about art, about contemporary art, about the various issues that we raise from the verbal to imagery or rather to imagery combined with verbal uh, content uh, as, um, as conceived by, by an artist. And this type of argumentation, supplementing more academic um, arguments in the form of written articles, um, really is one of the key concerns of what we're doing. So I like to refer to this as a, a hybrid element uh, or as a, a sort of, um, uh, you know, publishing hy hybridity, if you will. And uh, it's, it's key to what we do. The other section that um, uh, I think is really key to what we do and that somewhat distinguishes art margins from other publications, though it has been uh, much emulated, I, I might say, 
is the document section. That is to say, um, a section in which we um, publish original uh, documents that haven't yet been uh, uh, translated into English from various regional contexts of the world. Um, we have now quite a large and extensive networks of people um, who suggest such documents to us and who say, hey, there's this document, this article that came out in the 1950s, it was really crucial uh, for what was going on in art in my part of the world at the time. Uh, and could you, could you translate it and we will consider it and then we will um, publish a translation of this text together with a competent uh, introduction. Uh, and this too uh, contributes to this element of hybridity and this way of making arguments about art in ways um, that exceed um, the, 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 the formal academic one. And I might go back to what Karen said before about um, the way in which we try to, to frame arguments about contemporary art in ways um, that don't limit themselves to, to the academic ones, which of course still constitute the core of what we publish. But um, so in this way, uh, the, 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 the table of contents, you might add, of the journal already reflects a way of thinking about, about art that is somewhat, um, somewhat tangential, perhaps, to, to uh, mainstream academic uh, publications, and proudly so. Um, uh, and uh, indeed, even the layout, um, I should have said at the beginning that we're, we're very happy to be with the press, with the MIT press that we're with, who've been enormously uh, supportive over the years. Um, uh, of our work and uh, indeed the layout uh, that was that was produced uh, for the journal um, reflects this uh, this too in the way it sort of decenters uh, the content on the on the on the pages of the journal uh, again sort of highlighting an emphasis on on the margins um, that I think we'll, we may have a chance to discuss a little bit later what uh, this uh, often uh, you know controversially discussed term means to us but this element of marginality and hybridity, these two I would single out as being uh, core elements of what we think is special about the journal. Um, you know, it, from the perspective even of its uh, existence as a material object, uh, which to us is very important. Uh, thanks, uh, Sven. Kenan, do you have a, can you say a few words about um, sort of the mid-career and younger scholars that you know, Art Margins has encouraged, uh, you know, to publish in, uh, in the journal? Well, I think we have received, I was one of those scholars. Um, <laughs> they have received, um, uh, uh, we have received many submissions, but, it, um, and, and many of those scholars are now sort of prominent. So we got them when they were, yeah, Maria, Maria Garcia, uh, Fernanda Negrete, in, in different kind of fields. Um, and so I think, I know that Sven often thinks of this as in terms of in terms of a kind of mentorship in writing, um, but I think that um, I, I think that I, I tend to think of the 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 way that uh, Art Margins uh, publishes younger scholars in a broader sense of kind of publishing uh, forms of writing, as I'd said, that are maybe not so mainstream, not so in the center of art historical discourse. And this isn't limited by age or generation. So like one of my favorite um, pieces, like was one that we commissioned by um, Armando Cruz Malave, who's by no means a like starting <laughs> a young scholar. Um, he's a very established scholar, you know, um, but he wrote, you know, a review essay about the young, about a series of exhibitions about the young lords that really wouldn't have a place in a strictly academic uh, journal, but that touched on the very rich uh, sort of political history and institutional history of the exhibition. So I tend to think of the of the way that we publish um, younger scholars in, in the kind of broader sense of publishing scholars whose approach to um, you know visual texts really exceeds the bounds of um, of, of of what in my mind is a very is a kind of increasingly narrow way of approaching. Um, a, an increasingly broad sort of archive of possible histories and objects and theories. So I tend to see youth on the side of difference. <laughs> uh, so uh, may I remind our audience that if they have um, if they have questions or comments for the panel to please uh, post them in the Facebook chat and hopefully we will have time to to address some of them at the end of our, our, our discussion. Um, I wanted to move along to uh, to uh, thinking about the program of uh, you know behind art margins. So uh, some of these points have already come up, which having having to do with the question of take having a critical sort of um, a take on globalization and on global art history, um, and uh, also 1989 came up uh, the need to not reify 
uh, kind of these uh, uh, these benchmarks as uh, as having the same temporality for all regions. Uh, the question of singularity versus totality of uh, of thinking about life under capitalism, life in cultural forms under capitalism. The question of marginality, what constitutes a margin, uh, is another set of questions that uh, uh, that have already come up. Uh, but uh, perhaps this is a chance for uh, any of you to reflect more on these or other issues having to do with uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the the, the program behind uh, art margins, uh, broadly having to do with, with globalization, but other aspects as well. Anyone? <laughs> Um, I could go ahead. <laughs> I think, yes, the issues uh, and the questions that you brought up could be formulated as somewhat a loose program for the journal, though we always shied away from making a programmatic statement or a declaration. Rather, I think we prefer the format where um, our position, uh, both political and scholarly, and our uh, methodological approaches would come out through our very engagement, uh, not only with authorial texts, uh, in conversation with authors as we are editing the submissions, but also uh, the fact that many of us have published in the journal, um, as well as some of the special issues that the editors um, themselves have previously uh, contributed. And one example is uh, um, a more recent issue. I hope you can see my slideshow, which is uh, Escape the Landscape, um, oops, uh, apologies, I played from the start. Escape the Landscape, um, edited by uh, Octavia Neshanu, uh, and future, uh, future special issues. But perhaps like also methodologically, um, there is a certain commitment uh, towards, I would say perhaps a materialist uh, historiography, um, that looks at uh, artworks, institutions, artistic discourses in a, in a complex conjuncture between, let's say, net, national culture, regional, transnational uh, networks and affiliations and, and, and global discourses. Um, if I could, I mean, I think one of the things, I, I think everything that Angela said is part and parcel of what we've been doing. Um, one of the questions that maybe is kind of on my mind often is how do we move beyond sort of the critiques of global modernism or and their different sort of declinations like global conceptualism, global pop. Um, in other words, what is the what is in a sense like propositive or creative about the um, critique of these sort of academic frameworks um, that can come out in a way that is more than merely kind of a count, more than a mere counter example, right? In other words, how do we sort of create the critical frameworks that we need, right? Based on this, the kind of the, the richness of the, the sort of singular intellectual uh, institutional socio-political contexts that are being highlighted, right? How do the questions get reframed? How do the new questions get posited? Um, and so I don't think that there is sort of necessarily um, one answer that we're putting forth, but I think something that I would be interested in that I think is emerges naturally from the sort of program of the journal is sort of looking forward how to how to highlight those questions, how to privilege the sort of positing of those questions beyond the mere kind of illustration and critique of say, um, global modernism. So say like one, an upcoming article in the June issue of this year, Lara Yad's um, article um, on Ali Kamel Adib, you know, it highlights highlighting sort of, uh, for example, as an example, the history of an artist sort of that places it in, places the sort of national question in relation to sort of like, um, uh, class struggle in a particular context. Um, and that in so doing sort of gives a counter example to say the kinds of avant-garde groups that are not oftentimes kind of take the, that are oftentimes privileged in the sort of historiography of global art. Um, so um, yeah, I think the there's a kind of question about how we uh, sort of programmatically, how we intertwine um, how we intertwine a kind of critique of globalization or critique of the sort of aftermath of colonialism with the sort of discovery of a kind of a more sort of specific empirical um, histories. And I think that we're oftentimes, oftentimes our programmatic interest kind of manifests in that way in trying to highlight how that can be the case or how it can help posit kind of new frameworks for 
for, for historiographic work. And that's, of course, to a degree, a, a function of uh, the fact that, um, first of all, it's absolutely true that um, the programmatic issue has been one that's been with us as an issue for a long time. We have had many discussions about the need uh, or the absence of a need for a, a more programmatic statement or for some kind of framework um, that, that, that we might consider a program. Ultimately, I feel like the program of the journal is, of course, a function of what it does, uh, of what it publishes. And it's, um, it's absolutely true that, um, that, the, that the tension, if you will, uh, between the more um, archival work that many of the articles that we publish do and the more globalized critiques that Karen mentioned, the tension between those two is in a way precisely the space in which we operate when we have these discussions. Um, to some degree, the journal is what it publishes and what it publishes is what comes to us from those who send us their articles. Um, so, uh, so it's precisely that space that, uh, that, is, that is the space where programmatic discussions occur. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's also true that you know, we have never tried to have kind of a priori programmatic, um, a, pro um, a priori programmatic framework, uh, 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 unlike maybe other journals um, who go into the publication uh, of a, a, a with, with such a framework. Um, rather, we've seen it as something that evolves um, with what we do as editors. Uh, if, I, if I could add to that, I think about the programmatic, uh, it may also be that it's the case of our name, the word margins, that it, it acts like a code word that resists this kind of ideological appropriation or transformation into a symbol or a sign that can say to all of us what it means, right? Like it's a kind of a Surian arbitrariness between the signifier and the signified that it's not a it's not a sign that everyone knows what it is, but it's always depending on the code. It's always depending on the context. And as Sven has already said, the, it always changes. So what it was in, let's say, in 1990s, uh, 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 identified as margins, it's not anymore. And what is what it was in 2008, identified as, as, as uh, margins, it also changed. So in a way, the the journal kind of tries to maintain this fluidity and to respond to how the world changes and tries to somehow to identify or to set what is the next uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 margin that it should engage with. Uh, I think one of the problem that at least I have is always this uh, understanding that we deal only with, with a geographical uh, um, uh, margins, which I think we have tried a lot to address and we have tried very much to, to suggest that it's not only geography, it's not only cultures that have been ignored, that we would like to draw attention and to show that kind of art. We're trying to think about um, marginal events that occur also at the very center of our work the very center of our existence. And that is, I think, something that is maybe at the core of our program. It's something that we're still struggling with and we're still trying to work with our audience, with our submissions and to try to, to kind of to, to, to have a more uh, complex maybe uh, understanding of what margins um, 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 are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we are just getting going on this, but unfortunately our time is, I'm just looking at the clock and uh, I, I did want to, for us to have some time to look at the anniversary issue. And uh, um, so the anniversary issue is of course one that, uh, you know, marks the 10th year of publication. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, the editors would like to reflect on their involvement with the issue and how they, uh, you know, what it contains and, uh, and why. 
Maybe I can uh, give a give a brief introduction, and then the others can can join in. So the anniversary anniversary issue came uh, about uh, in essence uh, because we uh, we we wanted to celebrate the moment of uh, our you know ten year ten year existence, and we have been thinking about the questions a uh, question of what is radical in the context of. Uh, the many protests uh, uh, that had been going on in the United States, but also elsewhere. Um, the whole notion of radicality seemed to be one that um, that spoke to many of us. And the the uh, the question of what it meant to be radical, particularly in an academic context, uh, seemed to be one that was um, that was very much uh, on the agenda, um, specifically uh, regarding uh, art practices that lay claim to radicality but really often uh, fail to provide an adequate framework uh, for reflecting on what it is, that it, what does it mean to be, to be radical. So our effort really had to do with um, uh, trying to, to understand what radicalness might mean, uh, specifically when you're dealing with an academic publication. And so we turned to, uh, to, um, to scholars and theorists to see uh, if we could grapple with that question. And uh, we added into the mix um, two artist projects. Uh, and again, I should say that um, with the artist projects, uh, there was no effort to, uh, to, to present illustrations as it were of radicalness. Um, it was more an effort to invite these artists to, to reflect um, on what it might mean to be, to be or to act radical um, across time and regions, not limiting yourself to any one particular um, context. Uh, then we uh, decided or we, we added into uh, the, the, the main framework for what is radical, uh, a series of roundtables um, that reflect on questions related to core issues the journal has grappled with in the past. And to these, the editors of those roundtables can, um, can speak separately. Um, and um, for the first time, we produced um, a cover image that differs a little bit from the, the ones we normally produce, which usually figure a figurative image. So here we have something a great deal more conceptual, more text-based than we usually than we usually figure. We have the names of the roundtables, what is radical, um, art in class struggle, um, art under neoliberalism, um, art in scholarship in moments of historical danger. Um, and um, I can only uh, speak for, yeah, the, the, main, uh, the main round table, the one that, that uh, that stands at the center of the issue uh, uh, is, is one that um, I feel offers, yeah, offers reflections on the question of radicalness that uh, are per pertinent to our moment. I think I may hand it over to Karen and Angela to say something about um, their respective roundtables, if they wish to. Uh, okay, um, thanks Sven and uh, um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about my round table, the, the round table I organized, uh, but we'll also refer to the artist project because projects, we had two projects uh, which are exceptional. Uh, normally we publish one project. Um, and these are, as Sven already mentioned, they are newly commissioned works uh, specifically for the journal. And the editorial team works closely with the artists in developing this. And uh, the first project is by Anabo again, a Cairo based uh, artist, and it presents a series of drawings and the ready made uh, found photograph uh, of a Nasser era um, soldiers' march um, titled The Ghost of Past Events um, in the Hall of Mirrors. The project reflects on the intersection of wars and disease, specifically in the aftermath of World War I, as the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 was unfolding. It was to herald the new world order um, at the point of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, but also in conjunction with the Spanish flu pandemic that was to institute sanitary and social control over vast populations. So in a sense, both events have ghostly reverberations uh, today in our present, as the geopolitical divisions and orders that the treaty launched still explode um, in different parts or, or in different uh, ruins of the Ottoman Empire um, and the measures of social control during the Spanish flu have uncanny echoes of the global pandemic that started in 2020. Um, the second project is by uh, Icebox Collective. It's called Taxonomy of Breathing, and it maps uh, what the artists call 
precisely this taxonomy, taxonomy of breath. In our historical moment of the increased fragility of the body, and of course the references are to George Floyd's, I cannot breathe, um, to the toxic fumes of environmental disasters and burning forests, and also to COVID-19, which uh, attacks our lungs, the lungs uh, primarily. So in a sense here, breath becomes a physical and symbolic as well as political marker of the fragility of the contemporary subject. So the artists have sent out about 100 maps across the globe and asked the participants to record um, and reflect on their daily experiences. And these are basically very, uh, these, are, these are maps that uh, combine kind of the structure of the grid, the more objective structure of the grid with the personal expressive um, elements of uh, private experiences. So this is about the artist projects and just very briefly, my uh, round table um, art and scholarship in moments of historical danger asked um, several scholars to uh, reflect back on the moment of uh, 1930s uh, when Nazism and fascism were encroaching upon Europe and the world was uh, threatened to be to plunge into barbarism um, and focus on the debates where the question of the disciplinary boundaries of uh, art history and uh, art were becoming, um, were, were, were positing themselves uh, in the most acute way. Um, so this historical moment was simply a trigger to reflect on our own uh, moment of historical danger. So I invited participants to reflect on the possibilities of confronting this moment in our present and question um, the exigency of art scholarship and pedagogy and ask questions whether there is uh, still a line if fine or porous securing the fragile autonomy of the arts and humanities from commodification in uh, late capitalism and so you have responses from um, Vartana Zatian, a scholar from Armenia, Fred Schwartz who is based in uh, London, uh, TJ Clark, um, Sami Khatib from Berlin, uh, Ursula Frohne, uh, a scholar from Germany and Mishko Shubakovich from Belgrade. Thank you, I'll pass it to maybe Pedro. Briefly, yeah. Okay, so very briefly uh, here, um, I think, so just to say one thing that uh, picks up on what uh, Octavian was mentioning before, uh, I think on this uh, round table that Octavian and I uh, edited on uh, art under neoliberalism, precisely one of the attempts was to address um, this other kind of margin, perhaps in a kind of Derridian uh, sense of it, of you know, the conditions that somehow like frame uh, artistic practice today. So an, a margin which is not geographic, but um, what is uh, around and uh, determining uh, the way that art uh, is uh, practiced. And at the same time, there was a suggestion here in talking about art and the neoliberalism of the possibility that um, the, 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 the kind of uh, developments that uh, take place uh, with uh, neoliberalism as is one stage of capitalism, if, if you want, take it somehow to the vicinity of uh, artistic uh, practice or the aesthetic realm. So we were also inviting here, this is an, another, uh, I think, specific um, aspect of this round table. We invited quite a few scholars who are like very prominent um, uh, scholars of uh, neoliberalism, but not necessarily, um, not all of them are immediately engaged in art history. And some of them even were expressing reservations like, yeah, I'm not really, uh, this is not exactly my field, but that's part of what we wanted to do to bring those people to this conversation on art from a different perspective. So once again, going back to that uh, uh, plurality of meanings of, of the margin here. So I don't know if uh, uh, Octavian wants to add something or, or uh, uh, Karen uh, about hers. 
Um, very, very briefly, um, the art and class struggle roundtable, I think, shares a lot of some of the precepts with the, the rat, what is radical and, and also with, uh, with the historical danger uh, roundtable in the sense of kind of going back to the kind of going back to the beginning, sort of uh, kind of asking a kind of fundamental question, you know, what is the point, as Angela says, what is the point of what should art scholarship and pedagogy, how should it understand itself now, sort of how do we understand, what do we mean by art and what do we need to understand about the terms art and class struggle um, in or if we want to sort of think about drawing this connection again. And so I had initially posited it in kind of historical and formal terms, you know, what is what classes are we talking about? Um, are we we're clearly not referring to if we're not referring to the kind of 19th century French bourgeoisie, what is the kind of uh, what are the dominant classes nowadays? what is the what is how would we understand the kind of formal manifestations of their ideological viewpoints or what or should we throw away these kind of assumptions of the last sort of uh trails of marxist or post-marxist uh, uh art history from the 70s and kind of uh kind of cast that framework anew and i think the responses very much did not, did not necessarily respond to that question directly but i think took a more tactic closer to what pedro was describing in a more deconstructive sense of kind of um either questioning the very terms as in Jacques Lesra's contribution or in proposing sort of uh, instances that maybe have not yet formalized a response to the question or to the terms class and uh, uh, art and class struggle, but that I think speak to the conditions of possibility, right? The, the material conditions of, of the, of, or, or the manifestation of that problem, say in Genevieve Yu's uh, 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 piece on, um, on kind of labor conditions and protests around labor conditions and uh, the conditions of, of um, sort of uh, 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 the financing of art institutions and um, the labor conditions within them um, nowadays. Uh, so that's that's what I would say about uh, <laughs> about the art and class struggle roundtable. Perhaps we can move on to questions from the audience. Or... Yeah, no. So just before we, I mean, I'm looking at the clock as well, but uh, we still have a few minutes. Uh... Uh, but uh, in terms of what's, you know, the anniversary issue is, of course, an important one, but uh, what do you, what will you do afterwards? What Do you have special issues that are planned? Uh, what kind of submissions would you like to see uh, come your way? Uh, so if any of you would like to reflect on that. We're um, going I, on holiday. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say a, a few words about one upcoming issue. That's an issue did, uh, dedicated to didactic art. Uh, to some degree, what applies to uh, some of the some of what we just said applies to this issue as well. That is to say, it appears to take a well-worn concept that of didacticism, uh, one that uh, has variously been derided or vaunted in in the art world, um, didactic art uh, as um, as its kind of uh, key term, and then from there see, uh, seeks to re-examine this notion and see whether there is. Um, uh, there is still mileage, as it were, in this concept of an art that establishes a relationship with truth uh, in, in one way or, or another, kind of uh, moving away from, uh, from conceptions uh, of, of modernism based on formal innovation, uh, innovation and so forth, uh, to ones where the, the truth in, in some sense plays a central role. And uh, that's what we're examining here. Uh, we have, um, um, with my co-editor Tom Hollert from Berlin, uh, put together a roster of three uh, articles, um, one of which um, takes a more historical point of view. Uh, Judith Rodenbeck um, looks at an archive um, of um, historical or photographs uh, by uh, Alexandra Wex, uh, a German uh, post-war artist, um, who I think I may have gotten the first, her first name wrong. Um, um, who puts together um, a, an archive of gestures uh, by, adopted by, by women, uh, physical postures to, to examine critically um, this vocabulary um, of public um, uh, physical postures. Uh, we have another article um, that deals with the idea of access, um, uh, critically uh, looking at institutional ways of providing access and didactically um, um, manifesting uh, the problem of access to institutions such as museums. Uh, and the idea uh, generally is, yeah, to cast uh, light uh, on this idea of uh, didacticism in, a, in an art context. Um, and um, to, to see whether or not this is a concept that can still, um, as it were, hold up. Um, we, um, we, we look forward to publishing this issue, I think, in about two weeks. 
Um, and we have another issue coming up that uh, I think maybe um, Angela wanted to speak to, or that would be um, uh, another issue that we're looking at would be, um, I think- uh, You have debt and infrastructure. Uh, oh, that's right, it's not Karen. Angela, it's Karen. Sorry, yeah, it's Karen, the, the debt and infrastructure issue. Maybe you could say a couple of words about that. Yes, well, so that's not my issue. I just um, was, so uh, we've been in conversation with uh, the two special issue editors are uh, Francis uh, Niron Montaner and Max Haven. Um, and um, it's an issue, I think now titled The Arts of Catastrophe, um, that sort of takes us its starting point, uh, Hurricane Maria and uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico um, as a kind of way of, of uh, an exploration, both of the sort of visual culture that kind of emerged from it, but also as a sort of case study in a kind of laboratory of the relationship between sort of, of, of colonialism and capitalism. Um, and so it's a, it's a bit unique, I think, it's still coming together. <laughs> it's been in the works for a while, but I think it's, it's sort of rather unique um, in the way that it takes um, a, a sort of case study, let's say a country specific or context specific case study as a way of sort of illuminating dynamics um, that are now kind of that let's say were first uh, experimented work with over the course of the 20th century in Puerto Rico um, and that are now um, widespread. Um, but it also takes up some of the themes that we've looked at, I think that have come up in past say, for example, Adriana Campos Johnson's uh, review essay from a couple of years ago, it takes up the question of infrastructure um, as this question of sort of looking at this context through the lens of this intertwining of say ethical, ethical political and natural life, um, sort of in this relationship between politics and kind of in, and climate disaster. That's as much as I can say for now, it's still in the works. Elizabeth, you're relatively new to the board, but you also bring you know, a, a new expertise. So what would you like to see the journal do? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, um, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I appreciate about how the journal has been working to date is that they, they do provide a platform for people to bring special issues to the table and to the collective, and then we will work with them and through that, um, but also gives an opportunity for us to work together um, as editors and as a collective to um, really kind of workshop uh, special issues as we go forward. And of course, my interest coming from my work in African modernisms, um, you know, always will focus, I guess, to some degree on bringing more of those, um, more of those narratives and more of those histories kind of into the fold here, I suppose, and in, um, in relation to some of the other networks um, that, other people have already, you know, sort of uh, been fleshing out over the years within the art journals margin. I, I don't really want to um, uh, say too much about specifics about uh, um, particular um, special issues because I haven't actually consulted the editorial collective yet about them. So I'm not sure if I should announce them right here to everyone. Um, but that's all to say that, um, you know, I'm, I am very interested in thinking through some of the uh, issues of sort of speculative work around archives and particularly around uh, what seems to be a, a ever increasing kind of reboot of various festivals and congresses that occurred uh, in the immediate sort of, um, you know, period of sort of decolonization and post-independence and sort of what that, what that all sort of means um, and how we can think through these kinds of um, exhibition histories perhaps uh, in a much broader kind of framework. But I also encourage I have the platform, so I also encourage many of my colleagues uh, that I know in my kind of broader subfield um, to please consider contributing to Art Margins because uh, one of the great things about this project, I think, is that it, it does allow us to break down some of these silos that we work in. Mm -hmm. So I noticed we are beyond, you know, an hour already, and there were a couple of uh, comments and uh, questions from the audience. So one is uh, not a question, but Theodore Harris notes that the artist project section is good and third text journal online also has one. Uh, so this is of course a, a good thing if uh, more artists get to, uh, to do projects in critical journals that creates a dialogue between uh, thinking and, and making. Uh, the second question is, um, uh, is uh, by uh, uh, K1, Tafte, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but uh, the comment says, I thought the project by Icebox turned out to be an exceptional illustration of collective thought, echoing some formal structures of mind maps. I was just curious about some of the sources of the project, from where was the data collected? 
uh, perhaps if uh, Angela, if this is something you can perhaps address. Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you uh, for the question. Uh, what I spoke presented for Art Margins is part and par part of a, uh, a larger project. So they collected, they, they sent out maps to about 100 participants across the world that of, of their choice. Uh, so whether these were their friends or their random receivers, I, I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, the maps uh, came back with the uh, records uh, of, uh, of personal experiences. Um, you saw, I've already shown in another PowerPoint uh, presentation, um, the diagrams and drawings that were sent to them. This is the collected map um, that materializes also as an installation and other iterations that the artists uh, produce. And these uh, records of daily experiences mapped upon, again, um, upon the rational grid structure, right, that has been sent to them, um, also provides, becomes a source material for other uh, art projects that the artists um, engage other artists, collectives, and so on, whether these are photographs or videos or voice. So these are basically source materials that become reused or refunctionalized in other um, artistic projects that the artists themselves invite uh, participants to engage with. So yeah, I think it's complex and what you see in uh, Art Margins as we uh, printed the project is one uh, component, right, of a more, or the broader and more complex project. And of course, this is always um, our challenge for uh, the artist project section because we give artists 16 pages. So the page becomes the support structure the limit, but also the support uh, for an artistic proposition. Um, and some artists prefer to go um, over the limit in terms of offering maps and diagrams, but still they all have to struggle with, uh, with the limitations. Um, so in a sense, uh, the format acts both as a limit, but also a possibility to make propositions in a, on a printed page, which is of course also published dig digitally. I hope that the answer is the question or addresses some part of it. No, thanks, Angela. This is, uh, uh, I think uh, you also um, address the broader issues of uh, artists, you know, kind of in a sense, uh, shaping the project for the, for the journal. Um, so uh, I think we are out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted to thank all of you for for engaging and uh, for uh, giving your thoughts about art margins and its uh, its uh, its history and its future. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, uh, take care. <laughs>